the foods that made us, Coca-Cola, peanut oil, and keeping kosher. Begin with a quote, a quote that I've used in a number of, uh, of articles. Uh, this is from the American Jewish Archives. Uh, uh, somebody grew up on the Lower East Side, Sydney Roth. On the Lower East Side, 40 or 50 years ago, he's writing in the 1970s, Passover preparation started months before the holiday. Beginning about Hanukkah, when my mother went shopping for chickens for Shabbos, she bought only chickens with a lot of fat because now was the time to start saving schmaltz for Pesach. And who could have too much schmaltz for Pesach? You need it. Why do you need it? You need it for the uh, chremslach, for the potato lakas, for matzah, Brian, even just to put on a slice of matzah with a little bit of salt. You needed schmaltz because Pesach was a fleischach yant. Don't forget, this was in the days before Nye Fat, and the Rokach family was only making kosher soap for washing dishes. There were no hashkachas for canned foods. Chocolate candy was avada chametz, and even butter was better not, according to my father. <laughs> so there was very little uh, you could have with matzah except the schmaltz. And I've given you, uh, on the right side, from Moses Richens of Promise City, a map of the Lower East Side. And one thing that might be a little bit too small for all of us at home to see is that the Lower East Side was very segmented. If you were a Romanian Jew, you traveled to America in the 1880s to 1920s when the population spiked from 250, from a quarter million in 1880, by 1900, that number was a million. By 1920, there were three million Jews in the United States. So many of them disembarked Ellis Island. Their first stop was the Lower East Side of New York. But you didn't just move to anywhere on the Lower East Side, did you? If you were a Bialystoker Jew, you moved to the Bialystok section. If you were a Romanian Jew, you moved in with your landsmen from Romania, Hungary, Cernit Kovno, you didn't move to with, in with anybody else necessarily from Russia. You moved with people who knew you best, who ate the same foods that you did, who read the same books that you read. It was very much not a melting pot. And so part of our discussion today, I hope, will be really not just about the Americanization of kosher eating, and obviously that we're around Pesach, it makes for a good discussion. But also how different communities rallied around one another to migrate their food from the old world. And in the United States, that was part, that was an agency for mixing Jews together because they certainly weren't moving in with one another. So take a look, it's a little bit fuzzy, I apologize, but Crisco is kosher, an announcement that made into many ads and many circulars in the Yiddish and American press, English press. Rabbi Margulies, referring to the Ramaz of New York, the dean of the American rabbinate, Rabbi Zvul and Margolis, said that the Hebrew race has been waiting 4,000 years for Crisco. It conforms to the strict dietary laws of the Jews, and it's much better than schmaltz, perhaps. It is what is known in the Hebrew language as a parava, or neutral fat. Crisco can be used with both milchig and flesh foods. Special kosher packages bearing the seals of Rabbi Margolis of New York and Rabbi Lifshitz of Cincinnati are sold the Jewish trade, or should be sold by the Jewish trade. Um, but all Crisco is kosher, <laughs> all of the same purity. And so here I wanna, I wanna open up for a discussion is the role of the rabbinate in dictating the contours, not just of, of kosher super, uh, supervision, but really about food ways and culture in traditional Jewish life. Anybody wanna take us, uh, take the first stab at it? Somebody. <laughs> All right, I'll go. You want to unmute me? 
You're already unmuted. I'm unmuted. Unmuted. Alrighty. So what I find really interesting is is um, uh, the way in which these companies, uh, in this case, uh, Procter and Gamble is the parent company of Crisco, that they use tradition to market change because Crisco, as you point out in comparison to the previous uh, slide, Crisco is an entirely modern phenomenon. It's kind of uh, you know scientifically, chemically based and. Most Jewish households were not familiar with it or inclined to use it. And so it deploys pictures and language and rabbinic authority um, all to, uh, to make it okay. And, and so I guess in a way, the co-optation of, of rabbinic authority and the eagerness with which the Rabbanim, particularly the Ramaz, lent their name and, and their status to, uh, to commercial concerns is really quite, quite fascinating. I find, um, just following up on Professor Jocelyn, I find what's amazing is that it's clearly a transition from the previous slide. It means the previous slide said, this is a schmaltz holiday. It means this is mm -hmm. a meat holiday. Everything is meat, right? For breakfast, I mean, it sounds like, if you, could if you just you close your eyes and imagine, that they, instead of having butter, on their matzah for breakfast, they had schmaltz because you know because father said that you know that 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 butter was questionable. Now all of a sudden, Crisco, the way they market Crisco is that it can be for both milchik and inflation. The point is, it's not like it was. We're mm -hmm. changing it, right, Jenna? We're making it right. into an American Pesach. That right. to me was what was so amazing about the kind of the marketing technique of of the Crisco ad. Right, and they, they expressly call it a modern cooking fat to highlight the modernity, but they, they use all the, the traditional trappings of, of, uh, of the rabbinic pedigree to assure their users that it's, uh, well, still kosher. I find that uh, right. really fascinating. Right, I mean, that's amazing that what they say is it's parva, right? I don't know what you say about Crisco. You'd say Crisco makes better cookies or Crisco makes better you know, cakes or whatever Crisco does. But you would think in today's world, you would say Crisco's parva. You know, that's, 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 the, mm -hmm. you know that, that's the selling point of Crisco. Right. I would also add, since this topic is so rich, that uh, Crisco uh, not only uh, touted its wares um, in advertisements, but it also promoted uh, its res recipes using Crisco, just in case the language and the persuasiveness of rabbinic authority wasn't enough. And there they, they go beyond the par bit and they talk about how it's digestible, unlike chicken schmaltz, how it has a mild flavor, how it's neutral. Neutral, I guess, is the uh, synonym or substitute for par. Of. And the idea is that that, that um, you'd have a, a, a wider range of options to, uh, by which to cook by, and that you're cooking American while also cooking traditional. It's quite brilliant, I think. It is. It absolutely is. And I, th I love that you both seized on the idea that you have to have the rabbinic uh, um, support, the sponsorship of it, but not quite, Crisco's not quite identified as American, certainly not as much as Coca-Cola. Right here we go. Okay, <laughs> yeah, well, that was our cue, Adam. <laughs> Coca, I was going to say, that, um, Professor Ellis, that you started me off. You said that you know you mentioned a few times that we're turning lemon in lemons into lemonade, but I think actually what we're doing today is we're turning lemons into Coca Cola. Right. So um, or Crisco. My lemonade is probably <laughs> easier to make kosher for Pesach. So what you've shown everybody here is an ad for Coca Cola. It's in Yiddish except for the bottom box, which is the most important box in Hebrew, which I'll read in a minute. Right. This is found in an early 1930s, and that's going to be important, an 1931. early 19, yeah. 1931 edition of a rabbinic journal that was edited by Rabbi Shmuel Pardes, who was a rabbi in Chicago. And the story is like this. In 1931, the rabbi in Atlanta, Georgia, was a Lithuanian rabbi by the name of Rabbi Tovia, he took the English name Tobias Geth. A Lithuanian rabbi who was much more comfortable in, in Yiddish than he was in English. Now Atlanta was a very important city because Coca-Cola had its um, headquarters in Atlanta. And in 1931, Rabbi Pardes, this Rabbi Pardes, writes a letter to Rabbi um, Geffen saying, Rabbi Geffen, I heard that you are saying that Coca-Cola is not kosher 
and also not kosher for Pesach. You should know he wrote to Rabbi Geffen, and we have their communication. You, we, you should know, Rabbi Geffen, that there are several rabbis in cities around the country, around the United States, that believe that Coca-Cola is kosher and kosher for Pesach. Now, okay, so the problem here is that Rabbi Geffen has not taken an official position in which he allows for Coca-Cola to be kosher during the year or on Pesach. This Rabbi Pardes has a, has a, has a motive. These rabbis, he's, a, he's an important rabbi, these rabbis have, um, have come to him and said, listen, Coca-Cola is kosher, but the rabbi in Atlanta doesn't say it's kosher. So look what Rabbi Pardes does in 1931. In the box, very quickly, he writes, Bisman acharon bikarti et beit acharosha tarashisho Coca-Cola Atlanta, shel Georgia. I went to visit the factory of Coca-Cola in Atlanta, Georgia. Vehema ba'alei beit acharosha et galu lefanai kol ta'alumot. They revealed to me all the secrets because everybody knows that the formula of Coca-Cola is secret and it's in the vault, right? Viafta arobet hasodi et even the, um, the, the, the secret mixture it's kosher. It's kosher all year long, and it's kosher for Pesach. And he wrote several articles over those years in Hapardes, in which he said, basically, that Coca-Cola is the American drink. Now, now yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, so but, but Rabbi, what's fascinating, Rabbi Pardes doesn't own the Kashrut certification. It's not, Coca-Cola is not his client. I mean, he is responding to the fact that American Jews are drinking Coca-Cola. Right. So I, that's important. This was not a business then. This was pre-business of Kashrus. He's responding to the fact that Jews across America are drinking Coca-Cola. And basically, they. so here's the problem. Rabbi Geffen has a crisis because Rabbi Geffen believes that Coca-Cola is not kosher. But... Rabbi Pardes is telling him the Jews across America are drinking Coca-Cola, drinking it for, pay, for Pesach. So Rabbi Geffen decides that he needs to investigate this further. Rabbi Geffen is, is, knows, is friendly, it's a, it's a broad term, but he's friendly, with the attorney for Coca-Cola. His name is Harold Hirsch. Very quickly, Rabbi Geffen and Harold Hirsch's daughters went to high school together. Rabbi Geffen's daughter delivered the valedictory direct address at the, at the graduation of the high school. Harold Hirsch was so impressed with how brilliant she was that he paid for her education at the University of Georgia. She was a chemist. Rabbi Geffen approaches Harold Hirsch and he says that I want to explore whether or not Coca-Cola is kosher. Harold Hirsch is able to get for Rabbi Geffen the secret ingredients to Coca-Cola with the promise that it would be his secret. The funny part of the story is that actually it's his daughter who was his connection to Harold Hirsch who investigates and she finds two ingredients that actually were problematic. We don't know exactly what the ingredients are because he just gives them code names in the, um, in the tshuva. You can see that there's a, he calls it a Negron and Murius. A Negron and Murius are, um, are rabbinic terms to, to spices. He doesn't give the exact ingredient because Harold Hershen made him promise that he would not expose the real ingredients. The key is one of those ingredients was a grain ingredient, and one of those ingredients was a what, one of those ingredients was a grain ingredient, and one of those ingredients was a meat tallow ingredient. Now, the meat tallow ingredient creates a problem that it's not really kosher. The grain ingredient creates a problem that it's, that it's not kosher for Pesach. And he writes that he met with, the, with one of the executives in Coca-Cola. And that's all kind of interesting, because Rabbi Geffen did not really speak English. But this Mr. Montgomery is very impressed with Rabbi Geffen. And he says that I was impressed with the honesty of Rabbi Geffen. And he was willing to explore whether they could replace the meat tallow ingredient with something that was made from vegetables. 
and the grain ingredient with something that was made from sugar. And Rabbi Geffen describes in the tshuva that, that Professor Elif has presented to us, that he was able to get Coca-Cola to make these changes. Coca-Cola was kosher under the supervision of Rabbi Geffen, who you see on the left, and kosher for Pesach and kosher for Passover. Now, the question is, and Professor Jocelyn asked me this question during the week, come on, look at that, look at that rabbi on the left. Look at that, look at the words Coca-Cola on the right. This is Coca-Cola. In 1935, Coca-Cola is already one of the most um, successful companies in America. Not just food companies, but companies in America. You think that Mr. Montgomery and Coca-Cola cared about Rabbi Geffen? So that's a question that I can't answer. We don't know the answer. Just want to throw out very quickly, and then we'll have a discussion about it in one minute, just to throw out several suggestions. This Mr. Montgomery, the executive, says that he was impressed by Rabbi Geffen's, we would call it his Ehrlichkeit, his honesty, his good nature. It's always possible, Professor Jocelyn, that you know, he just kind of took a liking to him. And it may have been a big business, but he took a liking to the guy. But more probably, the reason that they, um, that they made these changes was that Harold Hirsch was not only the, uh, the, uh, the attorney for Coca-Cola, he became a part owner of Coca-Cola. He was an extremely successful and prominent businessman in Atlanta. And, he, and if Mr. Hirsch asked for something, it was done. As you saw, Mr. Hirsch and Rabbi Geffen had a personal relationship. So it goes to show that the fact that we're all going to enjoy our Coca-Cola, or we won't drink Coca-Cola, but we'll know that it's kosher, is going to be thanks to the fact that Rabbi Geffen and Mr. Harold Hirsch were friendly. And that led them to make, allow Coca-Cola to become kosher. Who wants to jump in first? Well, I'm happy to do the honors again. Adam, very persuasive, but I have um, two, uh, two additional ways of framing it. One is that the cost to replace these ingredients wasn't too great, right? Do we know uh, anything about the e right. economics of that? Because if it, if it took uh, a kind of reconfiguration of the plant and the ingredients were really, uh, the new ingredients were too costly to obtain, you know, friendship probably. Uh, they never would have done it. It was, it, right. it seemed to have been easy. Now again, it's hard to know what the company was like, but in none of the communication, is there, is there a feeling as if it's a big, uh, we would say today, it wasn't a big ass. It was an easy ask. Uh -huh. Do we have anything in the Coca-Cola records that record or reflect that's on it, That's so interesting. No. In the Coca-Cola archives, we have nothing. Rabbi Geffen keeps all of the communication. But of course, in those days, you only get the letters that were sent to him. There's nothing that he wrote. But there are a whole collection of letters. His communication was with this executive by the name of Mr. Montgomery. Mm -hmm. And it's a very friendly communication. And Mr. Montgomery, you know, basically is willing to do whatever Rabbi Geffen somehow communicates. He clearly, you know, we don't have the letters. So somehow he communicates with Mr. Montgomery and each letter back from Mr. Montgomery is totally willing to, um, you know, to accede to whatever Rabbi Geffen wants. Okay, so I want to throw out another possibility for all of us to speculate on. I have um, nothing to back this up except um, speculation, as I say. I'm just wondering uh, if this decision to um, accede to uh, Rabbi Geffen's wishes uh, is a kind of um, a form of atonement, uh, a goodwill gesture uh, for the Leo Frank debacle. I mean, it's quite a number of years later, um, but I'm just wondering if uh, sensitivity to what the, uh, the community had undergone uh, in the course of that horrific event uh, was something that might have motivated uh, Mr. Montgomery or compelled Mr. Montgomery uh, to be a little bit more generous than he might otherwise have been, especially if it didn't cost him all that much to, to make that grand goodwill gesture. What do you think? I mean, I love that suggestion. My, my initial thought is I'd, I'd love to see whether in the 1930s the Jews or the non-Jews in Atlanta were still talking about oh, the Leo Frank. So, so for, for everybody, oh. for the uninitiated, Leo oh, Frank... 
was uh, convicted of murder in 19... Everybody's testing me on my dates now. 1913, <laughs> murdering Mary Fagan. Um, scholars now point to the janitor uh, doing some forensic work that he uh, was likely the murderer, but Leo Frank was convicted um, and uh, before he could be commuted or otherwise, uh, a group, uh, and this is in Atlanta, Georgia, he was uh, hanged and killed uh, in, lynched, 19, lynched, excuse lynched. Me, in, in, in 1915. Uh, it was uh, a major issue. This is the age of Father Coughlin and Henry Ford. Um, Anti-Semitism in uh, the first decades of 20th century was on the rise. Uh, and certainly it was a part of the discourse of American Jewish life, meaning that Rabbi Geffen and the Atlanta Jewish community knew about it. Uh, a, a, a Vice President Hirsch certainly would have known about it. Um, whether this is overtly, if we could find it in the archives, that would be lovely, um, horrific, but lovely. Um, but at the same time, certainly from a, from a psychoanalytical perspective, um, might have loomed in the background of any decision-making about Jews in Atlanta. It was part of the, the conversation decades later, certainly. So I think, right, so that suggestion is, you know, is, you know, is such an interesting suggestion. I mean, I wonder whether we could find any record anywhere else of Leo Frank, you know, still being discussed. Though, though obviously, the Leo Frank case, I mean, as Professor Ellip said, it was never forgotten. It was impossible mm -hmm. that it was forgotten. The question is whether that would have, you know, that would have influenced them. I mean, I think all these suggestions are important suggestions. I, you know, I, I mean, I always like going back to the economy. The fact that it, it turned out not to be a big ask, and the fact that Rabbi Geffen turned out in Mr. Montgomery's eyes to be a good guy, you know, an Ehrlicher Mensch, I think, you know, probably made, you know, made a huge difference. And the fact that the ask came from Harold Hirsch, who was so influential, that had to make a huge difference. Yes. What, one more question. Do we have uh, Mr. Hirsch's papers? Um, we have Mr. Hirsch's papers. He also, we, oh, that's, that's interesting. We do have some communication between Mr. Hirsch and Rabbi Geffen. We have the eulogy that Rabbi Geffen delivered from Mr. Hirsch. So we have some mm. of that, and we have some of that, both Rabbi Geffen's papers and Mr. Hirsch's papers. We have a huge amount of papers, um, you know, in Coca-Cola also, communications with Mr. Hirsch about Coca-Cola. But this episode is not in any of Interesting. So that's pretty interesting, the omission yeah, that, being as significant as the commission, right? right. <laughs> so, so, so two items that I find incredibly interesting and somewhat curious. Number one, Rabbi Geffen, later in his life, is very proud of this chuba. He publishes it, he republishes it in several different volumes that he, that he comes out with at the end of his life, and even posthumously, his family, when they reprint some of his uh, most well-known chuba, this is the last one. This is the capstone in one of his fire. That's number one, is that he, that the Geffen family is deeply proud, this resonates, that he is the one who made sure that Coca-Cola could be the beverage of choice uh, for tradition-wielding uh, American Jews. But the other point I think is fascinating is that in the age that we think about rabbis as phalanxes, as people who are protecting ground and tradition, here is an attempt by an immigrant rabbi whose English is incredibly poor to protect American Jews from themselves and from uh, notions that Coca-Cola was kosher at a point when it might not have actually been kosher. Here is a rabbi performing a sort of a social justice crusade to ensure, to being proactive in making sure that America's drink could be the Jewish drink also. So I'll just very quickly say that that approach of being of being responsive to the needs of American of the American Jews, American religious Jews, because basically that's what we're talking about. The American religious Jews are drinking Coca Cola, is very much reminiscent to me of 1896 when there was a rabbi in St. Louis by the name of Rabbi Zachariah Rosenfeld. He also was an Eastern European rabbi who came to St. Louis. And he writes that he came, he came to St. Louis on the very first Shabbos. All the men were carrying their talus bags to shoot, except there was no Eruv in St. Louis. And he writes that he had two choices. He said he could have gotten up in shul and he could have screamed 
And he could have said, you guys are all violators of Shabbos. And he said, you know what I would have had after all of that? And he writes this. He said, all I would have had was a sore throat because nobody would have listened. And therefore, what he did was he figured out, and again, halachically, like you said, you know, there was some question about the Eruv that he created around St. Louis in 1896. They couldn't put up poles and strings like we do um, on the Upper West Side or in Chicago now. But he decided that the way to handle the, in or, the way to keep the Orthodox within the box of Orthodoxy was not to tell them what they were yeah. doing was wrong, but rather was to do, was to, to enlarge the box and to say what they're doing actually is right. So he enlarged the box by saying their carrying of their talus bag was permitted, and Rabbi Geffen enlarged the box by saying the Coca-Cola that you're drinking is actually Coke. So, so in other words, how I might put it is that they made America kosher. They made it viable. And the other side of that is that to make, and here is the Morgan Journal, to make America traditional. Uh, so here you have an ad, and uh, Shuli, um, are you still with us? Just to make sure. Um, I'm hoping maybe you can offer a comment about this. And um, here, and I'll also ask uh, Professor Joslet also uh, to comment, is that here you had pictures like these, and we're gonna get to one at the end. We have a really wonderful mm -hmm. selection for this. But here you have an image of the, in this case, I, it's most likely the Shabbos table, um, of different generations interacting with one another. But what's, I, what's so eye-catching to me is the food. Is the what? Is the food. Uh-huh. And, and how the food is displayed and which foods are displayed and how that ought to resonate by migrating that food way here to the United States. So what foods do you see on this? Well, I see I, wine. I see, I see, I see wine, certainly, which, which indicates it as such. And it's in, a, in particular packaging, which makes sense. And look at everybody's, um, look at their eyes. They're all focused on From whether him. he's the mm -hmm. father or the father, who's dressed very European. Mm -hmm. um, the others, maybe, and certainly the one closest to us is dressed in the European garb. But, um, but, and actually I would say no, I would say the, the son or the grandson next to the, next to the older man who's mm -hmm. making kiddish, uh, sitting down, not sitting scared. down. <laughs> All, right. All right. So he wasn't mm -hmm. a YU guy. Um, mm -hmm. um, he's dressed in a, in a, in a, in a short suit, right? He's dressed in a, in a way that a proper American might be. And they're all mm -hmm. fixated around the kiddish. And what is that messaging? to readers of, of, of an Orthodox public. Seems to be a family harmony, right? You could talk mm -hmm. about a generation gap. Maybe the older people are religious, the younger mm -hmm. people aren't religious. But sometimes the message is you use these products and you're bringing all the generations together. Um, in, in this case, yeah, Zev, you were saying it looks like a Shabbos table, but th this, this really is a, a Pesach ad. I don't think you have yeah. the whole thing down there. Uh, yeah, but... Um, it says Seder Nacht over there's on the right. Oh, okay, absolutely right. Absolutely, Seder Nacht. Seder Nacht. Nice. Of, yeah, yeah, it says Seder Nacht. Mm -hmm. And I have the whole thing in front of me, and there, it's actually ads for Old Dutch Cleanser, <laughs> and uh, one of the Come things they have here is Allah Yidin, Allah Zainab Befreit Gevarn von Mitzrayim. Everyone was freed from Egypt, a Befreyen Zainan Alt Geblieben in Shklafarai, but the women remained in slavery. So, you know, you use these products, you're making your life easier, but it's easier to keep kosher, it's easier to clean for Pesach, it's easier to have your family for, for the Seder. Um, so right. I think that's one and of the messages is sort of this, this family unity and harmony among and uh, generations. We, right, and we flip, and what about food ways in doing holidays, right? Not only Coca-Cola, but Canada Dry gets into the mix with their advertising, 
And each one you'll notice in separate advertisements are pushing forward their rabbinic certification. Uh, what do we make of this about food connected to holidays? Well, I think that it's not just food. I think that the bigger point that you're getting at is that um, well, a couple of things. One is that food advertisements and food practices crystallize the possibilities and the challenges of Jewish life in the United States. And so they provide a, a really wonderful lens by which to understand the, the give and take of, of that relationship between tradition and change. And they also speak to abundance and plenty and opportunity, not just the, um, the restrictive nature of, of ritual life, but, but also its, its possibilities. So, you know, putting it all together, I think the big takeaway from all of these ads, um, both in terms of their visual properties and, and the foods that they, they tout, is that modernization, contrary to what many sociologists used to think, modernization enhances the opportunities, at least in America, for an observant life. It doesn't detract or diminish. You have all these foods, you can have your, your Coke and, and drink it too. Um, there just seems to be so many different ways to um, be a part of the American experience, but also to retain your, your traditional mores. And food, food is perhaps the only uh, vehicle or arena that allows for that kind of reconciliation. That's why it's so very powerful and it doesn't call on people uh, to do a hell of a lot. It calls them on them to, to shop and it calls on them to purchase things and it calls on them to, to quaff a, a soda at the Passover Seder, which still strikes me as rather odd. Um, but it's, it's, all, um, it's all pleasant uh, and congenial and I think the affability of, of food advertisements and food practices uh, is really uh, what's at stake here and what makes all these these um, rapprochement between tradition and modernity um, really possible. And it's flowing, I'll say it again, both directions. So here you have one of the earliest editions, incarnations of the Mackerel Swell House. So I gotta remember, coffee was uh, on the verge, some thought, at being uh, branded kidney oats. And right. so Maxwell House, in order to procure its status as a Passover food item, there's nothing better. There's nothing more um, making something official than producing everybody's Haggadah. And so interwoven into the traditional texts become, uh, you got your free Haggadah, and who can complain about a free Haggadah? So food and tradition and modernity, um, it's having a conversation in both directions. Uh, traditional Judaism is a finding a way to embrace modernity through uh, new foods, Coca-Cola, uh, Pepsi eventually, certainly. Um, but also these foods, which are freighted with so much cultural meaning, and many of these foods we'll see with peanut oil in a little bit, were not known very well uh, mm -hmm. in Europe. Uh, they're looking to establish, to get getting a foothold by becoming part of the fabric or even the text of traditional Jewish life. So what, what I find so remarkable here is that it's really only in America that a Haggadah could, uh, a ritual text could be the handiwork of a commercial concern and nobody blinks twice at, at the notion that um, this particular Haggadah, which now gives the Bible a run for its money, is arguably one of the most popular of all ritual texts in this country. Nobody blinks at the fact that, that um, it, it's, it's the handiwork of, a, of a, a major commercial concern. And I find that really funny. Um, and uh, it speaks to so many of the, uh, the characteristics of American Jews. Um, it's accessible, it's free, it's a handy dandy size, it doesn't require much of a commitment. Um, it speaks to, to so many of the, the new values of American Jews. Uh, and apparently it continues to endure. Uh, just a few years ago, Maxwell House put out a more um, contemporary version with um, language uh, very sensitive to gender concerns. So it continues to have its finger on the pulse. Um, but the bottom line is that American Jews are completely comfortable with getting their ritual paraphernalia um, from a uh, conglomerate. Certainly. Uh, Adam, let me... Uh, yeah, go Sorry. Ahead. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, so on the previous slide, it was interesting, I thought, you know, the idea that you can be modern and that you can also, you know, be traditional. But I was struck in both these ads by the fact they take up a 
big part of the ad with the letter that says that yeah. the rabbi says that it's kosher. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess what I wanted to ask you was, you know, today, if you just said Rabbi X said it was kosher, the Ramaz said it was kosher, that would be good enough. Did people a hundred years ago care so much about kosher certification that it actually was worth putting the entire letter in the advertisement? Well, this is, and we'll get to this, and uh, Shuli, please uh, um, chime in and uh, take over if you like, um, is this is before uh, Orthodox Union, this is for the OU, in, in earnest, at least, before it became a brand, so to speak. So that letter, uh, representing the most traditional of items and seeing it, it also creates, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful image. Here you have, uh, they haven't changed uh, their font in quite some time, it seems. You have Coca-Cola, and right below that is the uh, rabbinic imprimatur. So you have tradition and modernity. Um, so that it's, it's outward facing, it's right at you. And it's this unbelievable uh, synthesis, harmonization of all the different factors that we're talking about. And I also suspect it's a, a very agile form of window dressing. You know, I don't know that they were all so concerned uh, to the degree that, that this material would warrant our thinking they did. It was a clumsy sentence, but you know what I mean? Um, but this just adds, it rounds out. It, it's uh, an establishment of credentials, you know, um, looks official. I really doubt that, that most immigrants at the time could even make out the text, let alone understand its implications. But I think you're right, Sev, the, the visuality of the text and its juxtaposition between one world and the other world uh, makes it a very compelling Right, you see device. the signature, you see their stamp, that you can make right. out whose name it is. Right. You can um, see the, you know, the, the letterhead. That's all you need. That's all you need. And you probably didn't even need that, but it, it, um, it, uh, does, it does the extra work of uh, reassuring the number of people who needed that right. kind in of In other words, sure. this was the U inside of the O before that existed. It could be. This was an icon. Right. This was trying to message something about mm -hmm. the bona fides of Coca-Cola and Canada. Right, right. One thing I, I like this, and this is a, the chapter one in my new book, um, is uh, peanut oil. And just so that we understand, so we began with uh, schmaltz and how quickly Americans mm -hmm. took to peanut oil. So this is a letter from the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1941 offering that a white form of refined peanut oil enjoys much popularity among the Jewish trade in several Eastern cities. So the nice. U.S. government is noticing, mm -hmm. and they're particularly concerned because in the war effort, other oils needed to go uh, to be used overseas for weaponry. And so peanut oil apparently wasn't very good for tanks and for uh, fighter jets, but it was very, <laughs> very, therefore could be left aside uh, for the kitchen. Um, and, but the U.S. government, is taking notice that Jews in the springtime are making ample use of peanut oil and Planters Edible Oil Company produces in the mid 1930s a peanut oil which is uh, not nearly as heavy as schmaltz. And, uh, and Jenna, you had um, made mention of this, is that a lot of the uh, kosher products in order, maybe in order to increase sales, but also to offer a level of authenticity of bona fide to their product would produce uh, cookbooks. So mm -hmm. here you have a Yiddish cookbook of 44 right. recipes, Passover recipes, 46, excuse me. 46, uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Using peanut oil. And eventually, planters would like you to believe that it is the Passover oil. Here's an ad much, much later. I think we'll probably do a different talk which talks about the rise and fall of, of Pesach oil, of, plant, of, of uh, peanut oil. Um, but this too um, is a way to leverage the kitchen, leverage um, a type of literature, cookbooks, mm -hmm. uh, that people, particularly women, as we'll see in, a, in a, another slide a little bit later on, um, are making use of. Uh, and all of these things are coming together. All of this is synergistic. 
and it's blending tradition, modernity. It's not, it's not replacing, it's, uh, it, these 46 recipes are not creating new dishes, new cuisines. Actually, they are. They some are in many are. cases. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, in, in some instances, sorry to jump up, in some oh, instances, yes, the cookbooks are free. Um, with the purchase of the uh, the peanut oil, um, and in some cases the recipes are traditional. In other cases, they're they're um, extraordinarily modern um, and uh, would, uh, in some instances, fit right in with our contemporary vegetable-based cuisine. Um, when I first came across this last year, uh, I was tempted uh, to, and actually did try my hand at several of the, the recipes, and um, well, I'm not sure I'm gonna do it again this Pesach, but uh, it was certainly fun to, to try my hand at a recipe and uh, try my family's patience at a recipe that came from 1941 that used uh, mushed cauliflower and uh, way too much peanut oil. But that was designed as something that was um, forward-looking and exciting. And, it, uh, it, it, uh, and a way, I just want to add this, and a way to, to quell what increasingly was called matzo monotony. Uh, so these cookbooks came in handy to, uh, uh, to do just that. And you take a look, here's the cover of the recipe book. It has right. very American looking, Amer mm -hmm. very American looking family. Uh, at the same time, uh, the candelabra makes clear that this is a traditional type of family. They are observing Passover in its uh, all of its details. Uh, and in, Jenna, thanks for uh, the correction, is that by combining traditional recipes and new, uh, not that you're sneaking in modernity, um, but you're making modernity more comfortable. Right. You're accommodating. So tradition is accommodating modernity in a way that's not confrontational or adversarial, but downright congenial around the family table. Congenial, I guess, a congenial type of bargaining. To use maybe- Do that a, again? A, congenial I, I would call it a bargaining, meaning that it's not either or, but um, all things are coming uh, into this space all at once, and they're finding some congenial way, mm -hmm. some softer way, to migrate uh, the old to the United, by 1940s, uh, you know, the the American Jewish community uh, was pretty fixed. Um, right. uh, the um, migration was curtailed in the mid 1920s, with the exception of rabbinic visas. Uh, it would open up eventually, uh, but certainly this was a way to again bargain with the complexities of culture, especially when it comes to life cycles and holidays. Uh, the way that my Bubby did it is the only way it ought to be done. So it's no small thing to introduce new ingredients, but also new recipes uh, into, the, into the Jewish repertoire mm -hmm. to open up tradition in a certain way. Right. What's also fascinating about this, and this grows out of your own work, is that uh, this little vignette uh, is a great example of uh, internal changes in the American Orthodox Jewish experience. Um, because at one point, peanut oil was all the rage, and... Um, most recently, uh, it's become off limits. Uh, and I think in its own little way, it underscores the increasingly stringent nature uh, of American Orthodox behaviors, the search for lots of different chumras, uh, in this case, in uh, peanut well, oil as being part of the kidney oat. So what's grand about it is that it's just a little food product, uh, but it contains with it a wealth of, of opportunities to tell a much bigger story, uh, both about the congeniality a bit, but also about um, changes um, 50 years on. And no less than Ramosha Feinstein, again, about peanut oil. Ramosha mm -hmm. Feinstein writes a tshuva in, I believe, uh, the late 1950s, early 1960s, and you can see that you can read through it the aggravation, wherein he writes that when I was a little boy in Russia, we used to have peanuts on Pesach. He's aggravated by this particular turn. And, and kidney oat is interesting because it's extra textual. Um, mm -hmm. and, but we'll cover that, uh, I think, at another point. Okay, just uh, bringing it up. But thank you. Uh, Shuli, uh, Adam, either of you might uh, want to take, because these are uh, terrific images um, that uh, Shuli was able to supply uh, for us from uh, the Yeshiva University <laughs> archives. Um, I'm going to minimize this. Um, and here are different advertisements. And it's, it's, to me, it's very fascinating because on the left, you have a, uh, an image which is very tradition, right? It is Yivna Beito Bekarov. These are 
Jewish slaves in Egypt who are exhausted from work, and it's a Manischew, it's Mott's ad, um, it is an iconic ad which speaks to the visuals of, of Passover night. Here you have in the second image, uh, you have, again, also Manischewitz Matzah, but instead of tradition, it is hope, it is America, it is the Statue of Liberty, and much later on, uh, Sunshine Kosher Cookies, which is one of the first clients of the Orthodox Union. Um, it's no longer about tradition or America, but it's Zionism, it's Israel. Right, Seth, so I think you have to unmute, unmute Shuli. See, I can find. Not sure how that's happening. Yeah, she's she's muted. I, I it was certainly not my intention. Unmute. There we go. No, Shuli, I think you have to unmute you. All right, well, maybe Adam, I'll try to work on this. If Adam, if you could offer a comment or two. Sure, do you want me to, to the screen move to the English day? The screen moved, excuse me. Oops. There we go. I'm happy to talk about what you want, but the screen No, moved. no, no, this one, so, this one in particular, thank you. Before we get to Shuli, I mean, the idea that the freedom of Pesach and the freedom of America are mm -hmm. equated in that man of Shepard's matzah oh, ad mm -hmm. is fantastic. Because mm -hmm. that's not generally, you know, this is Jenna's point about tradition and modernity. Tradition would tell us that the exodus from Egypt is unique. Don't compare it to the Statue of Liberty, right? That's trivializing it to compare it to the Statue of Liberty. But of course, modernity teaches us that we can appreciate the tradition better if we know we know how we felt or how our parents or grandparents felt when they saw the Statue of Liberty. Well, wow, if our ancestors felt the same way when they left Egypt, we can appreciate that that must have been a pretty major event because we can connect it there. So I think that's also, that's in a sense, the tension between modernity and tradition, but ultimately the fact that modernity allows us to better appreciate tradition. And I think what I always like, and I mean, this is, you know, Mr. Jenna, this is, this is you know, your, your topic and not really mine, and that is the advertisements. You know, who created these advertisements? That's brilliant because right. there's a rabbinic sermon in that advertisement. Because if you told me that Rabbi Joseph H. Lukstein was the advisor in Permanashevitz to create that advertisement, I wouldn't be surprised. It means it, it required mm -hmm. someone who, who had a broad perspective on understanding what the American experience was for the traditional Jew. And that's what, I'm, that's what I was especially struck by. In this. Mm -hmm. right. I also love the language here, gebenched, Zolzain America. I mean, to use that word gebenched in the context of, of uh, this particular ad is uh, just so evocative. Uh, uh, an ad for a matzah, which is... For a matzah, a, after all, right. Right, which, which also, which is unimpeachably traditional. I think Shuli is, and we've given voice to Shuli. And it's a modern matzah. Yes, great point, Shuli. <laughs> Run with that. Okay, and it's a mod. <laughs> okay, it's a modern matzah, right? Yet it harkens back to the exodus from Egypt. I mean, the Manashevits were machine made matzahs, um, yet some of their advertising, the one with Ibanet Beto Bakarov, it both. It's kind of speaking to the past and the future. Like, are the images, the people in there, the pioneers of this, that adds from 1929. Are they the pioneers of the Chalutim of 1929? Or are they, they the um, ancient Israelites in Judea? Like, they, these ads managed to evoke and conflate the past and the future. Yeah. And then as... So in other words, you're making this modern matzah that, that's produced in a factory in Cincinnati, you know, feel as though it was what the Jews were eating when they left <laughs> Egypt. Absolutely, right. You mean they weren't? Which is simultaneously <laughs> preposterous, but it, it betokens a, a certain cultural value. 
right. Right. Now, Shirley, if you could also maybe lead us through some of these sources, which is, we've been talking a lot about rabbis offering certification, but uh, as the OU and other um, kosher certifiers emerge uh, in American traditional Jewish life, uh, you also have some really interesting messaging which is going on. Okay, well, um, Sunshine Kosher Crackers, which there's an ad there was an ad on the previous page uh, with a bunch of kids. It was for Simchas Torah going into what looks like a traditional synagogue, the type that was on the Lower East Side. And here we have an English ad and it says, Sunshine Kosher Crackers are not baked with lard. And again, they're emphasizing the hashgacha, the certification. You can see the baker pointing it out. Um, and as Ev was saying, th this was one of the first hashgachas, which was by an organization, the Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations of America, rather than by an individual rabbi. Uh, so we're, we're getting in a way into almost the commodification of, of kashrut itself. Mm -hmm. But the Pilstein and his wife, Rebecca Fischel Goldstein, uh, Herbert Goldstein was the president of the OU in the 1920s. His wife, Rebecca Fischel Goldstein, was in charge of the uh, OU women's organization. And they actually uh, approached the Sunshine Cracker Company uh, to see if they could, much as Coca-Cola did, substitute some of the non-kosher ingredients such as lard with kosher shortening. And uh, Rebecca Goldstein actually is quoted as saying, we wanted to be able to tell our children what they can eat this, you can't eat that. So that was really the origins of one of the OU's first uh, products. Uh, the, and Why Sunshine Crackers? The OU subsequently Actually, why sunshine? Uh, it's hard to know that. It... Okay, well, for one thing, their factory was actually in Long Island City, their main factory, so they were somewhat local. Uh, maybe because it was something they thought the kids would like. I actually don't know if they approached other companies. In, in some of the literature mrs goldstein says now that we succeeded with that we're going to approach other companies yeah. but really it's it's a guess if anyone <laughs> has any conjectures well they do what i can say is they there's do nothing in the sunshine time. archives it, it, the heinz ketchup a few years later it's probably a few years later so the ou approaches uh, Heinz after securing the Sunshine account uh, and Heinz goes along with it and uh, about 20 years later in the 1950s uh, Mr. Heinz would receive something like the Lifetime Achievement Award or the Righteous Gentile Award uh, for supporting the OU and making sure that they could <laughs> broadcast um, this new and most outstanding, as they would uh, position it, kosher certification. But part of it is, and you see that from the third act, with the, uh, the image of the school teacher pointing out, they had to educate American Jews about what is this OU. Meaning in order for something, we forget this very often, in order to be an icon, you also have to teach people that it is an icon. And that's part of that, this uh, on the right, uh, this advertisement, which appears uh, in the early 1940s. Mm -hmm. So again, it underscores the power of the media. We don't need to be told that too often these days, but here's a great example of how the grassroots uh, learns to uh, appreciate new, new devices and uh, new vehicles of community and food practices through advertisements. And then of course, let's- And the companies learned a lot about the Jewish community. Right, right. Certainly. Certainly, and what's also fascinating, of course, is that who are they telegraphing this to? It's very often uh, the mother is the wife of the household. 
uh, whether true or not, uh, this, uh, for example, this one ad uh, for Spry Pure Vegetable Shortening uh, from an OU magazine uh, ad from July 1936, you have it on the top left, Orthodox women, right, Adam? It's no longer rabbis who are certifying, but along with the OU, Orthodox women hail new white kosher shortening. Mm -hmm. So it's so not they're, just- They're a different source of authority now, um, and you don't need the window dressing of all that uh, rabbinic stuff. You just need that little sign, which is enough. It looks like a union label. And, uh, and no more shortening is good because it's milchiks and fleshiks means right. they're not We've living in the, in, in the schmaltz mm -hmm. um, generation anymore. Right, right, of course. Absolutely, and then maybe we'll uh, conclude with this. Um, yeah, this is so beautiful. I'm sorry we can't see it in color. Um, what do you think it is? Oh, panelists, what do you think? Well, I know the answer because right. uh, this appears in Jenna's uh, essay. But yeah. go ahead. <laughs> so it's actually an advertisement. It's it's amber hued and and warm and delicious. It looks like a painting. Uh, clearly, it's another one of those uh, scenes at a, at a, a Passover seder where you have all the the family ma ma family members gathered. You have a mizrach up on the right, and you have all sorts of other things which have been cut off that clearly signify this is a Jewish home. Uh, and it looks like a, an illustration that you might find in a, in a calendar or uh, in a book of some sort. It turns out it's an ad. Uh, it was a poster that was situated in the, like a grocery store window. Um, it's now in the collection of the Jewish Museum, which underscores uh, just how, how varied our approach to history has become. Um, and uh, what it advocates is the use of uh, B. Fisher, Russian caravan tea for Pesach. You notice over to the left-hand side, this maiden-like person is making use of a samovar to pour Russian caravan black blah, 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 tea for a Passover Seder. And so a decade really before Maxwell House gets into the act, uh, Russian caravan tea uh, is making the case uh, of uh, kind of cementing a relationship between uh, a Passover and, and a particular product. And what I love about this uh, is it's also warm and endearing and multi-generational, uh, and it clearly uh, situates Passover uh, and, of course, the tea uh, in the context of, of family, um, underscoring again the connection between this particular holiday and, and family. Um, and so we come full cycle with this. It's, it's the ultimate um, modern implement uh, designed to shore up the good fortunes of a tea company, uh, but it deploy, deploys all of these um, associations between or among ritual and Jewish life and warm heartedness um, in a very effective package, I think. Kind of says it all if you look really closely. Even if you don't look really closely, it says it all. Right, final it's a thought. nice place to, to end uh, this conversation. It's really lovely conversation about the impact of modernization on American Jewish foodways and, and um, how food allows for all sorts of conversations and opportunities that so many other daily practices do not. Right, and everything is bundled together. And it really, that's why um, I was so fond of the title we chose, The Foods That Made Us. Um, yes, it's about food, but it's so much more than that. And bundled right. up, in all these discussions are, are how, we, um, how we interact with modernity, how we absorb tradition, um, but maybe this image more than anything else uh, teaches us how we transmit culture multi-generational. Uh, mm -hmm. And it all- We make it up. <laughs> we make it up as best we can. Um, so in any case, um, again, uh, thank you uh, to the panelists. Um, really, really wonderful. Um, Adam Mintz, uh, Shuli Berger, Jenna Joslett, terrific scholars, wonderful colleagues uh, for giving some of their time, and uh, all of you. Um, uh, the, well, thank uh, you for the opportunity to hold thank you. one this of was our really, favorite this topics. Really, it's it's really great. great. Really great. Okay. Um, everybody, thank you so, so much for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Take good care. Bye.